Hello again, uh, it's me, uh, and uh, hello to you, hello to the internet, hello to Jason Isaacs, uh, hello everybody. Uh, we're back with Marx, Lenin, Revolutionary Socialism, uh, and the webcam. Um, I'm sure you'll let me know if it's massively irritating or distracting. Uh, please also let me know if these videos are helping, and do tell your friends if they are. Um, and if there's anything in particular you'd like me to go over, we haven't got much time before the exam, uh, but do let me know. Which brings me to the point that these uh, are intended for the Edexcel politics exam. Uh, it will help you with your AQA politics exam. It will probably may even help you with your undergraduate studies. Who knows? Um, but I do hope they are helpful. If they are, let me know. If they're not, yeah, let me know as well. I can deal with constructive criticism. Um, and uh, let's get on with it. Now, um, I will say in advance that I'm going to cut through um, a vast amount of Marxist theory. So I do apologize to our Marxist friends out there if they feel I'm doing the man short shrift. Um, we haven't got time to do a huge deep dive into it uh, because it's very, very complicated. It's very, very interesting. And um, if you are interested in Marx, uh, a very obvious, nice, fun place to start is Mark Steele's lecture uh, on Marx. I will link off to that. Uh, in the comments, uh, as I will do to, uh, or in the footnotes, as I will do to other things as well. Anyway, I'll try to remember that as I go through. Um, uh, so let's push on. Okay, so we're going to start off uh, with the central problem. And the central problem is that the world as it is, is not a representation of the world as it should be. The world as it should be, uh, should reflect our natural state, argued Marx. And the natural state is one of empathy. We are naturally inclined towards uh, society. We are naturally inclined to helping uh, one another. There is that sense in which uh, we're bound by a common sense of humanity, a common sense of decency, or let's just call it empathy. Um, all of human society, therefore, is predicated on that empathetic thing. The links between the individuals within that society are human. They are emotional. They are innate. They are not contractual. And we'll come to that when we look at the Gesellschaft. Um, the key thing is that the natural condition of humanity is to be empathetic. The society that results or that emerges as a consequence is empathetic. And if that's the case, then that society should be fair in the sense that nobody should be winning from that society more than anybody else. If somebody is clearly the winningest, then they are. Then we have a situation that's profoundly unfair and we need to do something about it. And Marx stomping around Britain and Ber London and Berlin uh, at the tail end of the uh, 19th century looked around and he could see that this was profoundly profoundly uh, unfair and it wasn't just that it was unfair it was a state in which it was a, a dereliction of nature or it was an abomination of nature we had become selfish uh, society had become transactional and there were quite clearly winners and losers uh, within that society where people who were benefiting from society and people who were quite clearly losing that Marx argued was profoundly unfair and he proposed instead this theory of dialectic materialism whereby we had an inevitable logical scientific process uh, that would drive uh, human society forward and he believed this was an ongoing process and that this was essentially the driver of all uh, human history. Uh, but we're going to focus particularly on the industrialization bit. So Marx argued you have your industrialization. When you have industrialization, essentially society splits. Society splits into those who own but don't work and those who work but don't own. Did I get that? I always get that one the wrong way around. They own but don't work and they work but don't own. There we go. Um, so that was, Marx argued, and inevitability. It was also inevitable that sooner or later... This would dawn on those in the system, particularly those who were doing all the working but doing none of the owning, that this was not particularly fair. The harder they worked, the richer the bosses got, and that just doesn't seem uh, to stack up. Um, so uh, let's just move that out of there because it's looking a bit weird. Um, so this was not fair. Um, as they said, and as a result of that, that would lead to revolutionary consciousness because very, very simple maths tells us there's many, many more of those who work uh, but don't own, then there are uh, that uh, own but don't work, or in other words, the proletariat is greater than numerically 
the bourgeoisie. Uh, once you'd worked that out, then the next inevitable step or the next logical step was to uh, rise up. So Marx argued we had this uh, spontaneous revolution. And um, then having achieved that, having sort of thrown off your uh, bourgeoisie oppressors, uh, we would have the dictatorship of the proletariat. This is when the proletariat would take control of everything. So we would have the re-education of the bourgeoisie and the restructuring of society and indeed uh, the economy and all other things. Uh, along Marxist lines, so the elimination of private property, the state ownership of the uh, means of production, the workers' ownership of the means of production. Well, the workers' ownership of the means of production is kind of downstream. First of all, the state has to take control of that, and then uh, over time, once everyone's been re-educated and we've eliminated private property, at that point we'd have achieved communism, and the state could wither away. Um, we are now living in the empathetic society. We're working for each other. Communitarianism and solidarity and empathy are its own rewards. We have no need of the state, the state being a mechanism essentially of class oppression. So that was Marx's theory. Uh, he saw it as an inevitable process, a scientific process that would lead all societies to uh, this communist utopia. Uh, there was only one problem, and that was that it wasn't happening. So once again, this is how Marx saw things uh, panning out. Uh, the problem was that we keep, we seem to keep getting stuck at about this point. Uh, we would get to revolution, we would get to political consciousness, but that political consciousness was not tipping into um, revolutionary consciousness. Ah, said Lenin, I think I have the answer. Um, the answer is that we have our industrialization. Okay, we accept that. We have our class consciousness. We then have our political consciousness. But at this point, you are underestimating the deviousness or the resilience of the uh, of the bourgeoisie. They have an awful lot invested in this, and perhaps more importantly, they have an awful lot of control of the mechanisms of the state. And so, what they can do is they can induce a false consciousness in the um, a false consciousness in the proletariat, uh, specifically a false consciousness that tells the proletariat that actually they are benefiting from this particular model. And Lenin called that trade union consciousness. In this, the proletariat becomes complicit in their own oppression. Um, there are all sorts of things that you could look at to uh, demonstrate this. Uh, the one that I always remember is a, is a Simpsons episode where uh, Homer becomes the, uh, the trade union uh, steward of the nuclear plant because of course he does and uh, he starts to agitate the workers and then they uh, burns threatens to withdraw the dental plan and homer has uh, skin in the game as far as the dental plan is concerned and so while he has the opportunity essentially to bring down the burns empire he folds uh, and he folds because he needs to get braces for Maggie and Lisa. And so while he had the opportunity to bring down the entire temple and reap all of those benefits, Homer backed off uh, because he didn't want to lose his health insurance. I'll link off to that uh, in the uh, in the footnotes. Um, but I don't want to get distracted about it now. So Lenin argued the we had a problem here. The, the system got jammed. The sand got chucked in the gears. The... The bourgeoisie chuck a spoke through uh, a stick in the spokes and the revolution never happens. We get stuck in this uh, permanent hold there uh, while the bourgeoisie sit around and uh, in, in inculcate within the peasantry, within the bourgeoisie, sorry, within the proletariat, uh, this trade union consciousness. So, you know, don't worry about the fact that you are working in my factory. Look, have a have a car on uh, PCP and uh, have a holiday uh, overseas for two weeks and uh, have satellite TV and gladiators and football. Um, yeah, so that was trade union consciousness. And as a result of that, in your industrial societies, the, the bourgeoisie were able to stymie the revolution by convincing the proletariat that they would lose more than they gained. Um, so his theory was this vanguard uh, theory. Communism had to precede industrialization. So invidious was this trade union capitalism, so devious and pernicious were the bourgeoisie that the only way you could do it was to get in before uh, the actual industrialization, class consciousness, political consciousness happened. Uh, and then you had to target your pre-industrial societies. And uh, then you would send in your vanguard, your vanguard being your educated elite who would agitate the peasantry um, into revolution. So basically you would have these... Uh, people arriving from outside of society, uh, rounding up the peasants and saying, look, you don't know what's coming. I do. Um, it's not going to be nice. 
um, and seriously, you really want to do something about it now. Uh, you've got nothing to lose. You are living on different types of dirt. Um, if you don't do something about it now, it just gets worse and worse and worse. So, um, yeah, let's have a revolution. So you would have this uh, triggered revolution um, that would then again uh, open the door to the uh, dictatorship of the proletariat operating through the mechanism of democratic centralism, which is when basically everything gets controlled by the state but taking information from every corner of society and feeding it into the machine and doing sums. And um, under your democratic centralism, the dictatorship, of the, or through democratic centralism, excuse me, the, the dictatorship of the proletariat uh, would expand the state massively. I mean, monumentally. And those of you who've done Russian history will know that Lenin and Marx began this process of collectivization and industrialization, uh, whereby the state, far from withering away, just blew up uh, massively. And it expanded to control all aspects of society, the re-education of bourgeoisie, the elimination of all divisive forces, be it the patriarchy, religion, um, family. Um, all of these things just get tossed uh, into the mix uh, while we realign uh, society along these very, very complex Marxist-Leninist lines. Uh, in terms of economic, we again, we have the elimination of private property, but at the same time, we have whole scale, wholesale industrialization and uh, agricultural reform. And these are all organized by the state. So we have what I call a concertina state. Before the state can wither away, it has to expand massively to restructure society along those um, communist or along lines that will eventually lead it to communism. Um, so in a nutshell, with Marx, we have a spontaneous uh, revolution. The revolution, sorry, is inevitable and spontaneous, and it would happen in industrial societies, and then it would wither away. The state would wither away. Cannot spell wither. See me afterwards. Um, and um, that would, the state would wither away, and we'd wind up in that uh, communist utopia. Now, uh, Lenin, on the other hand, he argued that... Um, the revolution would stall in a post-industrial society, so he had to go pre-industrial. Um, he believed in vanguard theory, and uh, just a little different set. And again, I, I, I'm, this is a very, very blunt instrument because I've got about two minutes left. Uh, Lenin believed in vanguard theory. Mao, on the other hand, wanted to mobilize peasantry. It didn't matter how you triggered the revolution. You just had to trigger it. And, and ideally, yes, before uh, trade union consciousness could take root. Um, afterwards, again, what we see is the massive expansion by the state to re-engineer the, uh, the industrial uh, infrastructure, the agricultural infrastructure, and indeed the, uh, the, the, the social thinking of that society in a way that is going to um, lead towards the empathetic uh, communism. Uh, of course, that never really happened. Uh, all sorts of reasons why that was the case. My own personal favourite is Donbar's number. It's the idea that if you have empathy, uh, empathy can be stretched so far, um, but uh, not indefinitely, not indefinitely. And if you're interested in that particular idea, and I don't think I mentioned it in this particular uh, presentation, I would urge you to check out um, a very, very interesting guy by the name of Nicholas Christakis. Um, he has just released a book uh, called Blueprint, the Evolutionary Origins of a Good Society. I'm not going to pretend I've read it because uh, it's only just come out. Um, but he has appeared on uh, a couple of podcasts, perhaps most notably uh, Sam Harris's podcast, um, which is called, it was called Waking Up. It's now called um, Making Sense. And um, those of you who are interested in pushing this a little bit harder, uh, perhaps if you're applying Oxbridge or some of the American universities or you know LSE or somewhere like that, you might start to uh, look at some of these things. And you don't have to agree with everything Sam Harris says. He's uh, quite a controversial figure, uh, but his podcasts are always worth listening to. And uh, they will you know, give you some interesting things to talk about. So I'd urge that you do so. And I would also urge that you like and subscribe, please. Uh, quick shout out to Adam Buxton, who's podcasts I also love. Um, do drop me a line um, if you want a particular video or if you're interested in online tutorial. I'm very, very happy to entertain both those ideas. And uh, thank you very much for listening to this point. And um, I do hope these things are useful. That's what they're there for. So um, yeah, get in touch. Let me know how I can make them better um, or if there's anything particular you want to see. Um, I'm working on my dramatic um, entrances. I should also work on my dramatic exits. Uh, let's see how this one works. See you soon.